Welcome to the Interesting Podcast with Jedi Brian, number 32. Now, I know it's been a while. It's been a while. I survived a hurricane. Um, and then uh, it took me a really long time to, to clean up. I'm still cleaning up, but I survived, which is good. And um, back to give you guys another interesting, if I do say so myself, episode of the podcast. Now, this episode, unlike the previous 31 was just shy of a year in the making. Because when you have someone this awesome, you gotta build up to it. You can't just rush in. It's not healthy. It's not safe. But this episode is uh, my friend Derek Arnold. Now, Derek has been in a lot of things that I personally love, and if you're listening to this, I know you personally love. He was in episode 7. He was in Rogue One. He worked on Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. We cannot confirm nor deny any involvement in uh, the upcoming Episode 8. But I will tell you, Derek is one of the nicest, funniest people I've had on. We really hit it off. Great dude. Super talented. And uh, we, (laughs) we we just have a great time. We laugh throughout the whole thing. Um... It was so, so, so much fun. In this episode, we um, we find out the development process between the Lugga Beast and why I will forever hear Flo Rida's low when I see it. Um, we talk about him being from Canada. Uh, we talk about him going to L.A. for a little bit, uh, not to act. Um, and then how he got to London and involved in War Horse. The Night Watcher Worm, great story with Neil Scanlon. He was pal. He was pal, guys. I'm sure you all remember when uh, the trailers first came out for Rogue One and how obsessed I was with uh, aliens, like always. But pal from Rogue One, he's got some great stories with that. Um, He also has a show on YouTube with Tom Wilton, who is another uh, Star Wars puppeteer, actor, helped him with the Lug of Beast, um, and tons of other things. He was Ponda Baba in Rogue One, Tom Wilton. Um, but they have a YouTube show that we f- <laughs> we were having such a good time, we forgot to talk about it. Um, but it's called The Drive-In with Tom and Derek. And I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It is hilarious. Um, they drive to Pinewood Studios every day and made a YouTube show about their commute. And um, it's great. It's very, very great. Um, follow Derek on Twitter. He's a great dude. Tell him I sent you, and uh, please enjoy the uh, interesting podcast episode number 32 with Derek Arnold. Now for the theme song. Hello. Hey. Hey, hey, what's going on, man? Oh. Hey, how's how's it going? It's good. It's going very good. This is happening. <laughs> oh, you got you got a microphone and everything. <laughs> I I try my best. I try my best. You learn. You learn after a while. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, I'm all right, man. Yeah, I'm. Uh, well, it's four o'clock, so. Yeah. I'm good. It's only it's only noon here, so. <laughs> is it cold yet where you're at? Oh yeah, yeah. It just sort of turned winter here. Oh really? A couple of days ago, yeah. It just sort of just dropped and just went right into winter. <laughs> but it was it was actually doing really well, and then it just went. It just got bad. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. I was just in North Carolina, and it was way too cold. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, but you are you in Florida? I'm in Florida. I'm from North Carolina, uh, so I'm embarrassed yeah. to admit I get cold easy now. But... <laughs> well, like, well, yeah. I'm from Canada, and I get I get really cold here. Yeah, <laughs> does it? But it never it never snows. Oh, that that makes it's because of water, right? Yeah, I mean, like it. Sometimes it does snow, mm-hmm. but it's a very different kind of cold. It's kind. Of, it's like a wet sort of like once it gets in you, that's it. It's you just can't get it out of your system. <laughs> Whereas like in Canada, you know, and I'm assuming 
like North Korea. It's like really windy and sort of sure. bitey cold. Sure, sure. Like, what part of Canada yeah. are you from? Uh, I am from just outside of Toronto. Oh, so, right, on, right on. Yeah, there's a city outside of Toronto just west of it called Hamilton. Cool, cool. I've been to Ontario. Well, yeah, that's the, the province. Yes. yes. So Toronto's, yeah, Toronto's inside in in Ontario. there yeah wherever Where, where'd you go in ontario <laughs> uh i accidentally went to niagara falls <laughs> uh you crossed the border <laughs> yes we so we uh we went on a family vacation and uh we went to we were going to niagara falls and what we assumed was the american side and we <laughs> but it's the canadian side's yes. way better isn't it yes, dude it's way nicer <laughs> we accidentally ended up in customs <laughs> i will never forget we're in the car and we're just waiting and my dad just goes well I guess we're going to Canada. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. It's very nice on that side. Yeah, well, that's the that's the picture you always see in in, in everything is that that yeah. waterfall. Yeah, uh, yeah. We did the little, yeah, it's all right. did the whole boat thing. Oh yeah, the Maid of the Mist. Yeah, you have to. You have to. Yeah. That's good. It was very good. How long were you there before you made the jump across the pond? I was born and raised in in Canada. Cool. Um, and then I, oh, but I've been here. I've been in England. Well, no, no, I shouldn't say. That. So I graduated. I went to drama school in Toronto cool. for three years, and then I moved to LA for a year. Mm-hmm. Um, ironically, not to act. I just, <laughs> just I graduated. I did. I graduated uh, theater school, and I was like, Psh, I am burnt out. And everyone was like, Let's go and act. And I was like. I'm going to go and travel. Yeah, there you go. And, uh, yeah. My brother was living in LA at the time. So I lived with him for a year and just sort of learned how to surf. That was it. And really? then, um, yeah, I was just like, I spent a year. I was like, I'm not going to do any acting. I'm going to go to the beach. I'm going to surf. I'm just going to hang out and chill. And, uh, and then about 12 months, I was like, yeah, well, about <laughs> three, four months in, I was like, I got to do something. Sure. Um, so I started talking to my old high school drama teacher. Mm-hmm. who was living in London, England at the time. And he was going, you know, they're doing some really good theater over here, some really interesting stuff. You should come over. And my grandfather was born in Scotland. Oh, right on. So I can get what's called an ancestry visa, which is ah. uh, a visa program in order to get my citizenship. Sure. Um, and so I was like, yeah, cool. So after a year of LA, I moved back to Canada, applied for my visa and moved to to england and i've been here for about nine years now right on that's, yeah. not, that's not a bad track not a bad track i've never not tr- bad at all. i've never tried surfing is it harder than it looks because it looks pretty hard yeah i didn't like it yeah um, <laughs> did you i go- like i like the idea of it <laughs> sure yeah i like the way it looks <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know uh, but i could just never get over the sharks like i was always terrified of the sharks that's fair. and uh, i remember sitting on on our on my board with my buddy out in the ocean and I'm like looking around and he was like, are you looking for sharks? And I was like, yeah, yeah. He's like, don't worry about it. And I was like, oh, are they not on the beach? Did they not come here? And he's like, oh, no, they come here. But you'll never see it. It's They're not like Jaws, man. They're, man, they're, they're apex predators. They come from underneath. So you'll never see it coming. It's like, <laughs> that's, the, that's where the mentality of like, just let it ride, man. That's why surfers yeah. have it. <laughs> I know. I was like, I can't get over that. And if you get like, I mean, I, I got to the point where I was only riding like three foot waves four foot waves and those they're nothing big but when you get hit and you fall on a four foot wave oh, yeah. it completely demolishes you oh, i can imagine at, at any Man. sort of speed water becomes concrete <laughs> mm. it was horrible and i i just always loved the idea and i kept going back and i was never good at it sure uh, but then i finally was like i'm just gonna go you're like i guess i'll just be an actor <laughs> yeah. The, the, yeah the easier of the two <laughs> yeah supposedly yeah yeah <laughs> That's awesome. Where where were you? Were you in Santa Monica or did you go to Venice Beach? Because Venice Beach yeah, is well, crazy. We went to all of them. Yeah, yeah. We went to Zuma Beach, Venice Beach, Manhattan Beach, Malibu Beach. We, we just went down the coast because um, between my second and third year of college, I, I stayed. I went to L.A. for about three or four during my summer holidays, about three or four months. Mm-hmm. And my brother was out there. And at the time, they were living literally right off of Sunset Boulevard. Oh, right on. So we were just on Sunset Boulevard. But then when I went back for a year, they were um, just out like by Studio City, which was a bit away. Um, so I was, I was in LA, just like North LA. Right on. 
Yeah. I was there for two weeks a few years ago. I just went out oh, yeah. to just see things. I took my mom. She wanted to, she was like this big bucket list thing. I was like, all right, you ah. you have a lot of items that are in Los Angeles. Let's do it. And, yeah. Uh, it's a cool place. It's big. <laughs> it's big, yeah. There's a lot Everyone's of people. an actor. Yeah. Everyone's an actor. Dude, <laughs> tell me about it. I know. I was like, oh, God. So you, you made the right choice, I think. And you're in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's crazy. I didn't even, I didn't, I had no idea that I was going to be where I was. Now yeah. I just sort of, it was all just sort of, lit, it's sort of a cliche thing where you sort of say you fell into it. Um, sure. I did, I did fall into it. How did you get into puppeting then? Uh, puppeting. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> From the time you went to, because you went to London and you were there to do yeah. theater. Did you start yes. in theater and then, because I know you worked on yeah. War Horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I trained classically. I'm be- well, I went to classical theater, so I was like all about Shakespeare. Sure. Um, but as a kid, uh, I started my my father and mother put us. I have an older brother and a younger sister, and they put us in karate. Right on. Because my father does karate, uh, and so I started when I was on like five or six. Cool. Uh, with my brother, and then my sister started after us, and then we stayed in karate. It was like seven days a week until I was in college that's awesome. um so yeah so i was always quite like physical and jumping around and rolling and throwing myself into situations or downstairs or whatever it was sure. and uh so i yeah i went to classical theater and i came here and i thought they're gonna love me england <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna think i'm amazing you just start doing a kata on stage <laughs> yeah. yeah and they they definitely didn't like me um <laughs> they were like who are you and why do you have a weird sounding voice yeah. um <laughs> And I was like, again? <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh man. And, um, yeah, it was a bit, it was a, it was a hard go at first. It took me three years. I was here for about three years and I was auditioning and I was trying to get stuff. And I did like a couple of fringe shows, like maybe one or two fringe shows on stage. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it's like, there's, there's a couple thousand other guys that look like me, um, mm-hmm. and have a natural Sure. english accent so right, it's like yeah. <laughs> why why get the guy that is trying to do the accent when we can get a guy with the accent so sure. it wasn't that. and then um so i was trying to get into war horse here in the west end in london and uh i heard that it was gonna there's gonna do a sta- they were doing a stage version in toronto so i called up my old agent in toronto i was like look i've been trying to get seen for this in london for the last couple of years can you get me an audition he was like yeah totally so I flew to I flew back to Toronto and auditioned for the Toronto production of War Horse, um, and I didn't get it. Oh no! <laughs> oh, God, that was not the ending I was expecting. I know <laughs> I did it, and so I um so I was really sort of torn up, and but it was the British team that brought it from England to to Toronto, so I happened to get the guy's email that auditioned us, a guy named Mervyn Miller. Mm-hmm. And I emailed him and I was just like, "Look, I auditioned for you in Toronto. I just want to say thanks. I live in England." Uh, uh, I live in London and I'd love to work with you. So if you're doing anything in the future that you think I'm suitable for, that'd be great. And he was like, oh, dude, yeah, they're, we're recasting the uh, London version next month. I'll put you up for it. And I was like, wicked. Hey. And so I went and auditioned for London uh, and didn't get it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I know oh, you were God. doing War Horse, Derek. <laughs> I know. Anyways, what eventually happened was, is, um, uh, somebody got injured in the show. Ah. And so they called me up and they're like, we wanted to bring you on to the show, but everybody stayed, Every nobody left. Everyone re-signed their contract. So we had no openings. We have an opening. Do you want to do it? So yeah, so then I just jumped in. It was just just a crazy ride. I, I went in one day and they're like, can you learn the show? I had three weeks. And usually they have, um, usually they have two months. Sure. And I had three weeks to learn the show. And yeah, it was puppeteering the the big horses and whatever else. And I ended up staying in the show for like two years. Right on. So you didn't have any sort of puppeteering background before taking on war horse. No, no, it's a sort of, uh, it's its own little sort of entity. Really. They, they sort of don't really look for people who, who have puppetry experience because it's so specific. Oh yeah. It's like you're puppeteering a live horse. Like it's not, it's not marionette. It's not Henson style. It's like, sure. get in there. Can like, you do it? You're cool. the horse. Yeah. What part of the so, horse were you? 
Uh, I was the back legs. Of course. I was the Which ass. Which is the best part of a horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they say. Did you? Uh, how long did you do that for? Two years. Um, did you ever in go the west. to the front of the horse? <laughs> no. I, you know, I couldn't get my head around it. Because <laughs> it's like, it's, it is so... Um, because it takes three guys. You guys have got a dude doing the back legs, a dude doing the front legs, and a guy on the outside, or or a woman. Sure, sure. Both men and women. Yeah. Uh, and then somebody on the outside controlling the head. Um, oh, and yeah. so each one of you are doing completely different things with your head and especially inside you're like walking and looking and walking opposite to your human feet but you also are attached to somebody so sure. micro movements are massive things so it was, i just was like nah i can i can do the back leg thing i'm yeah. good here <laughs> how was the learning yeah. curve in that when you've got three people in one horse oh that can't uh, be, that can't be easy no that's my wife hello <laughs> she's an amazing photographer Ah, oh, she is an amazing photographer. I mean, she's not lovely. That I was following her work or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's good. Um, yeah, working with three other people is a bit of a yeah, like it's a massive, it's a massive learning curve. But I think the thing with it is, well, is like, it's it was a good foundation because at the end of the day, they drill into you right from the beginning. It's like, uh, it's not about you. Right. So, what are what are you doing? And how does it affect the image or the thing that we're trying to create? How does what you're doing right now affect the overall image? And how are you affecting the other people? So rather than worrying about yourself, constantly think about how I can compliment the person I'm working with. How can I compliment their work? Sure. And if they're thinking, how can I compliment your work? Then you're always working together rather than against each other. Sure. That makes yeah. a lot of, that's so much deeper than you would expect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to sort of take your mind outside of it and look at yourself and go, okay, yeah, like just less is more and like yes. just calm down. And it's really good prep work for, for any other theater or even movie work as well because you it then can, doesn't become narcissistic. You could write a book and say something like from the horse's ass wisdom. Yeah. I'm my life. Saying. My life is an ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's so there's so many ways to go about this. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing. And like it, you have one of those stories, like you said, it sounds cliche, but it's really not because it's very almost fate. You know, the fact that you didn't get yeah. War Horse for so long and then you got War Horse and then War Horse yeah. taught you skills that you now use today, which is pretty. Yeah. Cool. And I don't think I were, would be where would be if I had got the job in Toronto and stayed in Toronto for a, a year and a bit. You know, sure. I was in. I, I stayed in London, which was the better of the two because I was already living here. Sure, sure. And am I correct in what I read that you worked on the uh, that Olympic show with a giant Voldemort? Yeah, so then what happened was while I was in War Horse, I just randomly sent an email to a company called Blind Summit and because i know they work a lot with warhorse people and i was like you know i look i i work in warhorse i know you guys are doing uh, you guys do stuff with warhorse people uh puppeteers and all that i'd love to do any of um i'd love to do anything that you guys are doing in the future mm -hmm. and uh they were like well actually we're working on a project right now why don't you uh come in and meet us and i thought oh i got to audition so i but it wasn't it was a meeting i went in and met the guys and they're like we're doing the opening ceremonies for the london olympics do you want to do you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> of course. okay, yeah, uh, sure. Why? What's the, what's the catch here? Yeah, exactly. this is a trap. <laughs> yeah, this isn't, it's not supposed to be this easy. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so then it was, it was puppeteer in Voldemort and he was like 80 foot, 60, yes. 80 foot, something like that. Oh, I've got, um, but there was a group of eight of us on it or 10 of us or something like that. But yeah, hmm. so that was about a six week contract. How do you even audition for something like operating an 80-foot Voldemort? <laughs> well, this is the thing. I didn't. They were just like, we had, we had this really like, long chat. It. We'll figure it yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> and I had this really long chat, and they knew my background being with Warhorse, so they knew the, sort of the foundation and the skill set that had already been taught. Sure. And um, so they're like, yeah, all right, cool. We need uh, 10, 10 people to work together. Um, Dude. And that was it. Yeah. It was a crazy show. The whole, I mean, just it watching it, it's one of those where you're like, this took a lot of time with all the oh, beds yeah. and like a giant Voldemort. Like, what it, it was bonkers. What exactly is that Voldemort? 
explain that to me because I saw it and it's a giant thing and there's obviously curtains and there's yeah puppeting going on. What's going on? It was here? it was so ambitious. It was they wanted Voldemort to come out of the bed, yes. this giant like 15, 20 foot bed. So um, there's a company called Artem that that made him, yes. and it was the head, uh, and then the rest was fabrication, and then the hands. So the head and the hands were solid, and then the uh, the rest of it was it was essentially an eighty foot sail. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, and then it but it was lifted up by uh, some wires and a crane or some sort of really <laughs> magic. Yeah, magic, <laughs> magic crane, <laughs> winched up, and we had uh, it was a hundred foot or ninety foot uh, t- uh, lines from the head and out from the arms. So that was like our ongoing nightmare for six weeks was like that it that the, the lines would unravel and be knotted. Oh, so it was always no. like uh, the six weeks of just like constantly winding up rope to make sure that it would unwind perfectly every oh, single time. God. Uh, yeah, so it was a bit of a nightmare, but we got through it. Um, but yeah, it was about six weeks of, of just prepping. That's amazing. It, I mean, it looked like it. It was one of those. It's just like you said, it, very ambitious. I'd never seen anything like yeah. that. And just the sheer size of it. If anyone has yeah. it, they need to check that out. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. It was crazy. And that was the third time that we had actually the day that we we filmed it in front of, I think the it was world. like eighty thousand. Yeah, eighty thousand <laughs> people in the stadium. Um, that was the third time that we'd ever done it fully. That it is was insane. Like, the, the stress with involved with that much well, yeah <laughs> exactly we're all like it'll be all right we'll be fine we'll be fine just do it just do it just do it <laughs> get those beds out of here <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was great it's so good and it's so insane like with the industry and how specific it can be how the skills translate you yeah. know certain puppeteering that's very very neat uh so yeah. how did you get involved with pinewood so it was from that job, so um, it. just, I know it, it was perfect segues. <laughs> yeah, so it was just the, like just taking a chance and sending emails out there, and knocking on doors, and they just happened to. It was like winning the lottery. It was li- just the right doors. Sure. Um, and so we spent six weeks doing the the Olympics, and um, it was a uh, it was a lot of time of sitting around and waiting because we couldn't just sort of get the eighty foot puppet out and just play with it. It was like it had sure. to be time specific, and then we had to have specific like, you know, you only had an hour a day, but we were there for ten hours. Oh, yeah. um, there's a guy on that job uh, named Brian Herring. Oh yeah. So Brian, Brian was Brian Herring was on that job, and I'd never yeah. met Brian before. Yeah. So I spent six weeks with Brian, and uh, we just chatted about movies the whole time because we we sort of found that we were both movie buffs, and Brian's like a massive movie buff like oh yeah i think he's seen quite literally every movie ever made <laughs> and so we would always just chat about movies and try and stump each other uh we'll do like six degrees of kevin bacon oh, all the beautiful. time with like different actors yeah uh but that was in 2012 so I, I remained friends with brian and it was a year later he called me uh in 2013 and he called me up and he was like um hey are you uh you still in war horse I was like, yeah, I got about six months left on a contract. I think I'm thinking about leaving. He was like, oh, okay, I'm, uh, I'm working on a project. I was like, cool. <laughs> I was like, uh, what is it? He's like, can't tell you. I was oh, like, of course, of course. <laughs> oh, okay. And he's like, uh, come meet me at uh, come meet me at Pinewood Studios on this day. And I was like, uh, okay. And he's like, and uh, we'll chat some more about it. So I was like, oh, okay. And I'd never been. Uh, and I was thinking, okay, maybe it's uh tv show or commercial or sure. maybe a movie that'd be pretty cool right. uh and so i went and i had to sign some non-disclosure agreements for a movie called avco, avco. and um, avco and i'm going what what's avco <laughs> he's like just you know just read it and sign it and it's just signing away right and he's like great you signed it good uh you're sworn to secrecy uh avco's the code name uh Avco was I. Oh, I'm gonna get this so wrong. Oh. I think it was the theater that uh, Empire Strikes Back played at in L.A. That's. I probably just made that up. I probably just dreamed that and made that oh, up. I'm gonna pretend it's fact. <laughs> yeah, that's a fact. We <laughs> yeah. just made a canon. Yeah. <laughs> this that gotcha podcasting you've heard yeah. so much about. <laughs> so Avco was the code name, uh, and he was like, "Yeah, we're we're doing Star Wars," and I was like, "What?" 
it. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a that's a good reaction. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, he brought me up and he took me on a tour because at that time the creature shop was in uh, Q stage, which was like one of the newest stages built at Pinewood at the time. Mm -hmm. And so he took me on a tour through the fabrication department, the guys, uh, the men, women and men who build all of the aliens and creatures, and then to the droids, uh, and then through the hair department where they're making chewy and all of that. And so then and then brought me back down to creatures and essentially the thing that they would they'd pegged me for originally was uh what's called the lug a beast oh, but at yes. that time at that time we were calling it the small beast because oh, yeah. we that was its code name <laughs> sure sure that, we, did, we didn't know any names. yeah we did well we didn't know any names because all of those stuff all that stuff gets named in the visual dictionary yeah so a lot of times you know 80 percent of the time we don't really find out a creature's name until we open Read up it. the visual dictionary yeah sure, we sure. don't know um, so at that time it was a small beast and it was, um, they wanted it puppeteered the same way that the horses in war horse were, were, but uh, with two guys instead of three. So one guy in the back legs uh -huh. and one guy in the, the front legs. Did you do the so back legs? I did the back legs. There yeah. Cause I was like, look, I know, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> you just look at it and be like, you've hired yeah. the expert. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so they brought on, um, they were like, well, and, and Brian's in the beginning. Cause this was like. I went in on in October, mm -hmm. which is about seven months before principal photography even started. Dude. So it was a seven month uh, like R and D workshop. We were in every week, and originally uh, for the first like couple weeks, it was just me and Brian because we just he was there, and right. the luggage beast was going to be a full robot. It was going to just be a robot with um, Tito on top. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, and then. So Brian was like, I'm only doing this for like two, three weeks. Uh, but we brought in, uh, well, Brian brought in another puppeteer, Tom Wilton. Yeah. Uh, who Tom I've known from, great. yeah, who I knew from War Horse. And he's, you know, he's my, my best friend. Mm -hmm. So um, then it was me and Tom for about seven months just coming in every week. Dude. So I was, I was going in every day uh, to Pinewood and then running from Pinewood to run back to War Horse at night and do a show at night. That is amazing. Did the design yeah. of the Lugga Beast from the time that you first saw it to what we saw on screen change at all? Massively. Oh, huge. Like, huge. If, when we first really? started prepping it, it was just some styrofoam on some legs <laughs> with, like, a metal frame. Sure. And it was supposed to be a robot. It was just supposed to be all a robot. Um, sure. And then uh, it slowly changed, and they, they went through different designs. And we worked with a lot with... Uh, uh, jimmy and steve who were the main builders on it and we were in every week sort of telling them um you know this feels better and can we tweak this and you know if we have that there then that's a lot easier to to maneuver and make and then um it was getting heavier and they were putting more and more stuff on it and then they were like yeah it's half beast half robot and we were like cool whatever Sweet. that means <laughs> yeah, i'm into <laughs> it just put me in there <laughs> and they're just like and it's it's now going to be in the desert. And we're like, what? Cause the first two weeks of filming the force awakens was in Abu Dhabi. Yes. And they're like, it's in Abu Dhabi. And we're like, cool. Yeah. And they're like, it's going to be hot. And we're like, yeah, it would be all right. And, uh, <laughs> you end up like Jim Carrey I, and the rhino. Oh my goodness. <laughs> or like, I can't even, at the end, I think when it was fully fabricated with Tito on top, who was played by Karen Shaw, who was a oh, legend. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think in the end it weighed almost, uh, it was upwards of like 300 pounds. Good Lord. That's, yeah. well, given the size, I mean, it's yeah. not great, but given the size, that's pretty incredible. So Tito, yeah. Tito was a person. That yeah, was a yeah, yeah. As, a, as an actor named Kieran Shaw, who's done everything. He's done, he was uh, uh, He was in Dark Crystal. He was, he was an original Ewok. I mean, like, he's done it all. He's, he's done it all. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, he was Tito. How did you get into the Lugga Beast? So what was your entry point. Don't uh, see the just, butt. <laughs> yeah, no, just just right up and underneath the belly. Um, so on on location when we were in Abu Dhabi, you would see uh, our human legs, and then each of the Lugga Beast's legs had poles attached to the feet. Oh, so that we okay. can manipulate. And then in post production, they just painted it all out. So sure. on the day, if you were watching us, you could you would see clearly two humans inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. manipulating and moving the beast around and then post they just erased us so you, it was just you and tom inside the lug of beast yeah shaw on top and that was it that was wow. it 
That is yeah. amazing. Yeah, three hours, four hours into the desert. Yeah. And it was a <laughs> it was a three day shoot. <laughs> Dude, how was that? How was being in Abu Dhabi? I'm assuming it was your first Hot. time. Yeah, it was <laughs> my first time in Abu Dhabi, and right. it was the first time I ever stepped onto a set. I because I'd never done a commercial or a student film or even a film before. Nothing. Dude. So the first time ever stepping onto a movie set was in Star Abu Wars. Dhabi. Yeah. <laughs> In Abu Dhabi, I was like, "This is this is surreal." This is it. Yeah, I know. I was like, "Well, I've peaked. Like, I can't. Where do I go from here?" That's right. That's right. I guess in, the, in, in that thing. Yeah. Um, awesome. So yeah, it was about four hours into the desert, and it was about um, I don't know the conversion. It was about fifty degrees Celsius. Okay, that's uh, hot. Hot. <laughs> yeah. I don't Very know hot. what. The, yeah, it's really hot. Whatever it is in Fahrenheit. Yeah. Sure. Did you? Were there any like? I mean. Were there any sandstorms and stuff like that? I know they no. in Tunisia, so you didn't. Yeah, that. no, no, we were quite lucky. Um, That's good. Yeah, see, the first week it was like, eh, first week is in like the salt flats or something like that, and that's where they film like all of um, uh, all of the stuff with Ray and uh, Simon Pegg and all of that. Oh yeah, okay. The metal and, post. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and that and that was amazing in itself. We got the first two days was a like a rehearsal day, so crew weren't really on set. Sure. So I just remember walking with Tom, and we're just walking through the outpost, and nobody's there, and it was just dude. me and Tom. And I was just like, dude, this is surreal. This is weird because they go into detail. They were building it for months, just letting the weather just take its toll on it. That's and so yeah, we spent spent the better part of two weeks just sort of in the in just the living. Desert living in star wars yeah i think about that sometimes with this new like a disney park thing that they're doing with star wars land yeah they're making like sets where there's going to be characters walking around and it's going to be like you're in star wars yeah like i know a guy who knows what that's really like (laughs) yeah that's my desk i spent i spent about 75 percent of my life just in cosplay yeah essentially (laughs) really good cosplay (laughs) i love it i love it when you're when you're the Lug of Beast, or and we'll get to your other characters, yeah. are you crew or are you cast? On paper, on paper we're on paper we're cast, but it's right. it's a weird thing with 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 puppetry. It's it's a hard one to sort of. It's such a gray area on yeah, set. Cause yeah, and you sort like of feel both. it. Yeah. yeah, because at the end of the day, the crew are looking at you, going, "Well, you're crew," and you're going, "Well, I'm not because I'm doing that thing," and they're like, "Well, you're not because that thing is not real." <laughs> you're yeah, like, exactly. "Yeah." <laughs> No, guys, I'm really the alien. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a it's a weird one too. Um, and, and there is always that thing, like especially when you do like a, an animatronic head, like you know when you get into the the aliens with like the the mechanized faces, mm-hmm. you know th- there is that misconception that people you, oh you just stick a mask on and it's like yeah that's like that's, that's like yeah thing. that's how you do it physically you stick yeah, exactly. a mask on <laughs> that's the but beginning. there's a whole other skill set involved absolutely um, yeah I, so I think about the... um what was his name jesse essen who played uh Stacey tin in episode two this is a jedi master with the horns on the side oh yeah yeah, yeah 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 he got his job in episode two he's an australian guy when they were filming in sydney and he was mm-hmm. actually a part of the building team he was really? built he built uh count dooku's speeder his sail sailor oh, at the end and his brother played kit fisto and they're <laughs> really? like and they're like, we need a guy to be this Jedi Master in the arena. And they just called him up. So he literally <laughs> went from crew to cast and talked about how he's up there, like, doing cool Jedi moves. And the crew's just making fun of him because he's one of them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a bit, it's a bit weird. I mean, but, but they do, um, like, a lot of our, like, a lot of the fabricators in, in, in the creature department and all that have jumped over and done yeah. little cameos and guest spots for little things. So sure. it's there's so a bit cool. of crossover. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, so you, did, you did the Lugabees. You did. Uh, I, I, I never know how to. Sp- I never know how to pronounce it. I'm gonna say Villisham, but you were a chancellor. <laughs> chancellor Vilchum. Yeah, Villisham, Villisham, Villisham. Yeah, something. Vil- Whatever it was, you were a chancellor. <laughs> yeah. Well, that came off of Voberdan. Yes, it did. Um, so two new aliens, Tarsunts. Yeah. So we did uh, Voberdan, but because we, me and Tom, were there for the better part of seven months. Um, R and Ding the Lugga Beast. While we were there, they were just like, "Like you guys are here. Do you want to? Do you want to do some like other stuff?" And we were like, "Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Sure." <laughs> um, 
and that's really a lot like how Neil Scanlon, like he works his department. Like it is very much like a family and you just sort of jump in and help. Like even in Abu Dhabi, the, the sandworm that sort of pops yeah, up yeah. and looks at, uh, uh, that was me and Neil. Was it Scanlon. really? Yeah. It was like this one thing where at the end of the day, JJ was like, um, sure. Yeah, we can, we can, yeah, why don't we use that? Why don't we try that? That that looks cool. And yeah. it was this basic seesaw rig that was like six foot where <laughs> I stood at one end with uh, a lever and pushed down the lever and then the head would raise. What? And we had about 40 minutes to do this shot because the sun was setting. And so we were like, great. We got about while they were finishing up on a scene, we all went over and we got about six guys and we we're digging a hole. Digging a hole in the desert's <laughs> impossible. Um, <laughs> it just keeps filling in on itself. It's just sand. <laughs> yeah. So we just all kept like pushing sand and pushing sand. Finally, enough to move. And we were just like, great. Just put it in. Put it in. And uh, we filled it all up again. And uh, Neil was like, Derek, give it a test. Give it a test. And so I was like testing it. And I was like, oh, this is really. It's not, it's not giving much. And I was pushing down and just heard a snap. And I looked at Neil. And Neil looked at me. He's like, what was that? And I was like, I think I think it broke. <laughs> so we we moved the sand and we undug it. Uh, undug it and we, we found that the, the bar had snapped. So I couldn't I couldn't give the up and down, but I could still turn it left and right. Yeah. And uh, we were running out of time. We had like maybe 15 minutes of sun left. And... JJ had he, he always has a god mic where he talks and then everyone can hear him, That's which cool. is a it's an amazing thing because then everybody knows what's going on. Nobody there's no confusion. Right. And he was just the whole time just just, just essentially just making fun of us um, <laughs> over this god mic. Um, and in the end, what it was in that shot in the movie is Neil face down in the sand with his arm on the on the pole. And me, um, him lifting it up to give me the leverage in order to to give the eye line for the monster while BB-8 rolls by. <laughs> it was just like, and we we I think we did maybe three takes because we ran out of light. Sure. And I I remember saying if this makes it to the movie, it'll be my favorite story. Uh, yeah, and sure it's enough, a good yeah, one. Yeah, it did. So it was um, <laughs> so it was very much that sort of mentality that that Neil likes to run in the in the group is like you just jump in and do things and with. Uh, Voberdan, they liked him so much that they're like, we should build like another one. Let's make <laughs> like an older one. And so we had uh, Chancellor Vilchum. Sure, that's so cool. You're like, this guy's cool. Let's get another one. And then you're reading the Visual Dictionary. You're like, oh, I'm the head of the New Republic. <laughs> you were just, I was just like, cool. that's a cool thing. And I didn't even know Voberdan was like the head of controls or whatever it is. Yeah. And, like the ground crew. I was like, great. Yeah, I'll work with that. <laughs> that is so awesome. That's one thing that that I love about Star Wars. It's like it's so, it's so creative. It's an atmosphere where everyone just contributes. Mm -hmm. And like you dug a hole, and now Forces of Destiny has a whole episode on the Night Watcher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 the the crazy thing too is like when we were on on um, when we were in the rebel base, rebel base, um, uh, I was just walking around because Wolverine was a a crazy where his face is on top of my head. Really? So, yeah, in order to make him look, I'm looking at the ground and his face is on, on top of my head. So if I were to just stand up normally, he'd be looking at the roof. Weird. So, yeah, so Jake Lunt Davies, who designed it, he really wanted to create this interesting shape. Yeah, um, it's kind of. Yeah, hunched over quite yeah. a bit. And that's because I'm looking at the ground, looking through Voberdan's neck. Huh. And, and then controlling his face like that. And the animatronics that were built by... Oh, there's so many names. <laughs> uh, 80 Parish built the animatronics, and it was beautiful, the articulation in the mouth and the eyes. Yeah. And um, it was JJ. He, he he looked at it. He's like, we got it. We, we can't not use that. And was, we were on set. It was halfway through the day filming a scene, and he was like, we need to give this guy – We need we need him to say something because we can't not let that – be on yeah, film sure. and he, he was like on the day we were just he was just jj was just throwing out lines he was like just say this just say that <laughs> and we were getting all these lines and that's how essentially volberdan got that uh that line in the movie but on the day i think it was i forget what we said on the day but it's different from what we said in the movie but um it was sure. it was that creativity it was just yeah. jj looking going let's use that that's so, so cool i always yeah. wanted that if you're in it so you've got you're in the costume. The face is on your head, and is there's st- there's the mouth moving and stuff moving on your head. 
How weird yeah, is that? There's an external puppeteer, yeah. So there's usually a guy behind the camera looking at us, and he's the one that's mic'd up so that the actors and sound can hear oh, the external okay. puppeteer talk because it's easier for the external puppeteer to talk and manipulate the mouth. And so we right. just sort of, because you spend a lot of time inside the head and you can hear the 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 animatronics moving and you work with them so closely, you sort of get that feel of timing and, you know, sure. playing off of one and each other. It's again, it goes back to that whole idea of, you know, I'm going to help you and you help me and sure. we're going to make this look good or try to make it look really good. Sure. It's like pure collaboration. It's like Frank exactly. Oz, you know, Frank Oz would have like a monitor and he's looking down while uh, going about his hand moving Yoda. And uh, it's it's crazy, isn't it? That whole, that whole, that now, well, the whole Muppet style and Jensen. Yeah. And now you do that stuff, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Which I mean... was, it's just bizarre. You're just like going, okay, cool. I guess this is what I do now. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Was was uh, the Chancellor or Voberdand, was either of them more comfortable than the other? Because I'm sure the electronics is basically the same, but the costume's very different. Costume's different. is the same mech, so it's the same um, headpiece. Mm -hmm. So what, what we do is um, when you get uh, in the fabrication shop, in the creature shop, you get a mold done of your body. Oh, cool. So, and then they take a mold of your head and so that it fits any any animatronic head that you wear fits perfectly to you and they build off of that mold um that's cool but costume wise both of them were really comfortable com yeah. compared to some other stuff yeah, yeah. <laughs> compared to pow say pow is pow is a bit more um in, oh, in rogue gonna, one we're gonna get into pow in a we are, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna look we're, at the rogue one we're going in on pow yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's cool. That's so cool. Cause I always wondered that. Cause I know there's electronics involved and it's insane. That's neat. Yeah. So did you get the whole like mold done where they had to stick the straws up your nose and like? Well, they've 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 advanced a little bit since since those days. So that's um, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> probably so they, best. Probably, yeah, I've had uh, yeah. So I had a bust done, which they they do from uh, sort of your your pecs up. Sure. And then Very you do appropriate. Full, yeah, and then I did a full body one, which is like. Oh my god, you full body. But um sure. The stuff they use now is like it's quite lovely actually. It's like a day at the spa. <laughs> sure. So they can they can put it on with their hands and it stays in to pour it. So they can really? work around your nose, your nostrils, so they don't need straws up your nose or anything like that. And uh it warms. It's made with like seaweed as well, so it's really good for your skin and so it's just like I always Tend there to you fall go. Asleep when I do them, they have to keep like don't fall asleep because you're gonna move the the mold. Don't fall asleep because oh, yeah. <laughs> it's really relaxing. It sort of warms up, and but it's only about thirty five minutes. Yeah. Did like when you're doing it, you're like, if I just move a little bit, we got to start over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's the worst. I was like, Ugh. because at the end of the day, you're covering yourself in like Nivea cream so it doesn't rip off your hair. Um, sure. <laughs> so you're just like, just covered in Nivea cream, well, head to toe. <laughs> yeah. I've seen some behind the scenes. Actually, you as well. Uh, but Mike Quinn, who did Nine Numb, he's got this like cap that goes on his head. Uh, yeah, putting so the head he. On. Oh yeah, so th um, those are just balaclavas, really. Um, some people wear uh, the balaclavas, and that's just to sort of gather sweat and keep the hair out of the way. Sure. Um, I don't perf like. I don't usually wear a balaclava, but yeah, Mike, Mike, that and that's just a simple like. Sure. <laughs> You're like, nah, I'm in it. I am. Yeah, I'll be like, I'll be all right. Yeah, I don't really sweat that much. <laughs> sure, sure. That's so cool. That is yeah. so cool. How long did the scene with the Chancellor take? Because it's a, it's a serious moment in Seven. It's <laughs> the a first order blew up the Republic. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was a crazy, because uh, uh, this is what I understood, that there, there was more to that character and that sort of story arc, but yeah, we yeah. never filmed more right so whatever was going to be more was just sort of maybe talked about but that was a night shoot that was one one night shoot um and it was just that one shot and i think we we did it for close to 10 hours over and over and over again sure. um so yeah it was one night shot night shoot from you know five five six p.m till four in the morning five in the morning standard uh, yeah it's a, it's a really weird one because it was this this they'd gone and, and built this whole costume it was a beautiful costume mm -hmm. uh a really comfortable costume too uh but yeah it was just one night shoot one day and just that, done that's pretty cool that's a big moment. yeah it's a big moment. yeah yeah it was cool and you were in a studio for that one 
which is probably probably that was best. in the back lot. That was outside in the back lot. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were outside for that on uh, on about a, a 15, 20 foot um, uh, sort of deck. It is crazy how this kind of stuff comes to be. I mean, yeah. making, making any movie is like a miracle itself because you got hundreds of people working on something. But yeah. Star Wars specifically, the things that go into making it, that one scene, it's so yeah. pivotal and it's so yeah. important and yeah. so much is going on. It's so cool. But it's, it is is incredibly worth it. And and you sort of see the amount that they, they put into it. Oh, I mean, yeah. you, have a, you, you, know, you usually have a crew on, on a Star Wars movie. Sometimes on a main unit, you have a crew of four or five hundred people. Sure. Um, and there's an added stress to that because if you if you're not on your game and you're not hitting your mark, and mm-hmm. because a lot of time in those costumes, a lot of time in those animatronics, you're blind. You're completely blind, yeah. and you can't hear anything. So you have a an earpiece, and someone's guiding you. And if you're not hitting your mark, they have to redo a take. Mm-hmm. And if you're redoing takes, you're wasting 500 people's. And that's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. So, (laughs) you know, you have to sort of be mentally focused and just sort of bring your A game and just know your stuff or else you're going to waste a lot of people's time. And if you're talking like 16 hour days, that's uh, not a good place to be uh, (laughs) Yeah. You don't want people to know your name for the wrong reason. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. When 500 people know your name and they know it for the wrong reason, you're like, oh, God. Yeah, here comes this guy. I can't hit yeah. his mark. Yeah, my name's Tom Wilton, by the way, if you yeah. want to know, yeah. Let's <laughs> just throw him under the bus. That's perfect. That's perfect. He's that creature guy. Yeah, of course he is. Mm. Trust me. I know for a yeah. fact he does creatures. Yeah. Tom. My name's Tom. Yeah, I think he's in War Horse, too. Yeah, that's the yeah, 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 true yeah. things about Tom Wilton. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> that is awesome. Was there was there any difference for you playing the two guys, uh, the Chancellor and Voberdand? Or did yeah, you kind well, of approach them um, the same? Or? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, you know, we talked about it with uh, Paul Casey's the movement director. Um, great. Yeah, he well he plays Eloasti. Uh, uh, he was uh, he was Radis, right? He was and Radis. Yeah, he yeah, needs yeah. To get yeah. On Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, he he's sort of and he's not really on Facebook either. Yeah, he sort of is low key. He's done a lot. Like and he's done a lot of Doctor Who. Uh, yeah. he was in Blade. Um What? I didn't yeah, know. yeah, yeah. I think that was Dude. like one of his first about Jaws, like one of the vampires with the jaws and all of, I think it was the second one. Was that the second one or first one? I don't know, so I haven't awesome. seen them. Yeah, the big like open yeah. novel ones. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um uh, yeah, so we chatted a bit about that, and he was just like, yeah, you know, we'll keep him the same, but obviously he's older, so we'll get him a little, you know, if we, you, 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 you go through walk cycles and patterns sure. and all of that, because at the end of the day, you don't know what's going to be used. We don't really know what's going to happen, so we go through mm-hmm. every scenario and just so that we have it in our dictionary and repertoire if they need it. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. What is, how long does it take from the time that they show you the character to, like, being on set? Because it's a process. Like I said, you got to learn walks, you got to do costumes and stuff like that. And yeah, you're there for seven months before you even shot anything. Yeah. It's a crazy process. Yeah, it's a long process. Uh, <laughs> and, it's worth and, it, though. Yeah, exactly. And I remember with the Lugger Beast as well, because, you know, we had done seven months of this stuff. And it's just an absurd amount of time for a movie to be prepping one character. Sure. And um, I remember talking to Neil about it, and he was like, five seconds, seven. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, seven seconds. If we get seven seconds, I'll be happy. And I went, well, hold on a second. <laughs> you want <Wait> seven <laughs> seconds? And he was like, seven seconds? He goes, you know how long seven seconds is in a film? He's like, that's an amazing amount of time for that creature. And I was like, oh, okay. And I, I remember it was like the second or third day we were shooting. And, you know, it was hot. We were tired um because we only had about 45 minutes to shoot this thing but after 20 minutes our bodies are starting to go into shutdown mode because they're oh, yeah. shaking and we, we can't move and thank goodness they weren't recording audio because we were like are we <laughs> recording audio and they're like no and we're like good because we're just gonna yell <laughs> <laughs> and i think you use your uh brave heart yells while pushing yeah the, the beast. crew the crew knew when we were hitting our peak was when we started uh i would start to sing flow riders low the yes. apple bottom jeans because i was like tom we need to sing this song because it will take our mind off the pain and yeah. uh, i remember we, it was one of those days and neil we were resetting for a take because 
with that with with the lugger beast it wasn't like you know sit around okay get this right okay let's go for a take it was like take uh action cut reset action cut reset hurry up come on we got 45 minutes and i remember neil sort of putting his head under the belly of the lugger beast and he was like boys i want my seven seconds seven (laughs) months for seven seconds and we're like yeah okay cool (laughs) <laughs> really? that, boss. <laughs> yeah it was like the pep talk that that big pep talk that the coach gives you before second yeah. half <laughs> just that's, yelling at us that's amazing you work so close with neil scanlon who i'm a huge fan of because i as a kid that was one thing i loved about star wars and as an adult as well is the aliens i'm in yeah. aliens man and neil scanlon is like dave elsie was to the prequels you know yeah. he's the dude we have these alien creatures because this guy and his team and yeah and he's got an eye for it and he does and that's where he is where he is and that's why he has an oscar and he's been nominated for another one is because yep. he comes into a room and you know you might be with your team sort of working out a problem and he'll just have the solution in 30 sure. seconds and you're just like how did i not think of that that's because right. he's been in the business for you know 30 odd years and he he knows his stuff and he knows this world so well and he just knows what to do to make it right for film. Um, but yeah, he he is where he is because he is who he is. Sure. And you've worked with him. And you got a great story of him yelling at you. <laughs> yeah. Well, well I got a couple of good stories of him yelling at me. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. Seven seconds. That's good. Mm. That's good. We did yeah. so much work. This is going to make the cut. Yeah. This is always really good. But yeah, it can, it can differ. You know, you can get seven months with a character or you can get you know, two weeks for a character or they can call you up and say, or you can be on set and, Mm -hmm. you know, we film some stuff and they'd be like, what are you doing right now? And I'd be like, I'm just waiting. And they're like, are you shooting right now? I'm like, no, he's like, good, come with me. I need you to assist this guy. And I'm like, cool, got it. There you (laughs) go. Just, you just jump onto other creatures and characters uh, that need assisting. Sure. Speaking of that, did you work on Fantastic Beasts? I I did. Tom did. Tom did, yeah. Me and Tom both uh, jumped onto Fantastic Beasts. That was right through uh, our friend. His name's Robin Guyver, uh, who who worked on on uh, Star Wars as well, and who we knew from War Horse. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so we worked with War Horse. We've worked with him on on Star Wars. Robin was the head of the Hapabore. Oh, right on. Yeah. So That's there were cool. five guys in the Hapabore, one in each leg, and Robin Guyver in the head. And really? I think he went on to do maybe one or two other creatures in, in Force Awakens. Um, and so he, but he originally, a couple of years ago, he did Gravity. Oh, he, right on. Yeah, Sandra Bullock and, and George Clooney. He was he was one of the puppeteers manipulating them in Zero Gravity. That's and, cool. uh, <laughs> What have you puppeteered? Sandra Bullock. Sandra Bullock, yeah. <laughs> so he got called up to do, uh, uh, head up the the visual uh, team for um, visual referencing team for Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. And um, so he called me, me and Tom up and a couple of our other friends. And yeah, we went on to work with, with that movie and just doing all of the referencing stuff for all of the beasts that were all CG. Sure. Um, Sure. So we were on set rehearsing with, with, so we would do on set rehearsals Mm -hmm. with sort of like prototyped, uh, you know, a rump pins and nifflers and stuff like that. And then for the actual takes, we would step behind camera and give them eye lines and referencing. Oh, right on. That's cool. So you've had like both sides of puppeteering and creature. Yeah. Effects. Right on. Yeah. And that's that side. You're very much more part of the crew, but you're still sort of interacting with, with the actors a lot. Sure. Sure. I didn't know there are five people in the happy boy. That's pretty in the cool. Boy. Yeah. One in each leg and one in the head. Yeah. So how was how big is that in relation to the Lugga Beast? Like just fear size. Uh, five guys, it's got to be a lot bigger. Yeah, so that was maybe about three, like two times. Uh, yeah, double. Well, bigger than double. Yeah, a lot bigger. Sure. We, his code name was the Big Beast, and our code name was Small Beast. Oh, so there you was, go. Yeah. So <laughs> what, the the head operator got to knock over John Boyega. It's pretty good. It's pretty yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And again, they rehearsed like moving and running and all of that. And again, when it came to the day, they were like, nah, just just make them drink. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that makes sense. Like these are war horse guys. They know. Mm. They know what's up. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So I I gotta ask the 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 questions that everybody asks all the time. What was it like working with J.J. Abrams? Eh. 
<laughs> yeah, it's all right, I guess. I mean, it's okay. It's got a god mic, which is kind of cool. Yeah, he's all right. Um, <laughs> yeah, but he's J.J. Abrams. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, he's an incredibly lovely guy. Uh, he surrounds himself with a team that knows how to do their job and do it to the best of their abilities, and they're an amazing team. Sure. The, the story I tell about J.J., because, you know, like, at the end of the day, I'm not his best friend. It's not like I walked on to set and I was like, J.J., How's it oh, going, yeah. man? I hear you. <laughs> You're like, hey, Derek. <laughs> like, you was like, What's up, man? You kind of yeah. high five on the way to Crafty. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, the few times that we did have an interaction, we were shooting that um, that scene where uh, it's at the end where the, the Falcon takes off um, and there, everyone is sort oh, of... Oh, you're waving by? Yeah. 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 And I was in Volberdan, I think, that we were filming yep. that... Uh, at some sort of nuclear base, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, Green and Common. And um, we'd done the whole day, and uh, that was like a week-long shoot or something like that, two weeks or something. And I remember I was in the shoot, I was in Voberdan, and we had just wrapped. And usually when you're in one of those animatronic heads, when they wrap, you know, everybody walks away and they, they go to their... You know, wherever they need to go. But if you're an, an, an animatronic head, you stay where you are and you wait for your team to come to you because you can't see yeah, it. You can't see <laughs> Yeah. You just see Voberdan walking into walls in the back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was just waiting for, for I say, and it takes like 10 minutes to take off these heads because you have to disconnect the batteries and cables and chin sure. straps and, and skull caps and everything like that. So you have to take your time to get the costume to a point where you can lift the head off. And so we're about five, 10 minutes taking this head off and taking the head off. And I look, and about 10 feet from me is is JJ, because they just wrapped. So it's JJ and his first AD, and then a couple of the other assistants just talk, talking about the day. And, I, and he clocked me, and he sort of stopped everyone around him and chatting. He went, hey, hey, man, um, thanks for staying inside that head for so long today. We really appreciate it. I was like, oh, yeah, of course. That's I was like, awesome. yeah, good job, man. And it's like, he didn't have to do that. You know, sure, I'm, sure. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm nobody at the end of the day. I'm the guy that's just inside that furry head. Uh, but I think <laughs> so it's sort say. of, yeah. <laughs> but I think it sort of shows like the, the sort of the person that he is, is that he, he is so aware of everything that is going around him. And he takes that time to acknowledge everybody that is working around him. And, and it's those things, those little moments you use, like, you didn't have to do that, but that just yeah, it speaks makes volumes me want of to, character. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes you want to work harder and, and do more and do a better job. So sure. that, yeah, that's what that's it was cool. like working with him is and yeah. those moments with Bober Dan inside the rebel base where he was just like, we need to give this guy a line because yeah. <laughs> he can't not. And it's like, so he sees those things and he's, yeah, he's just a, he's just a cool dude. He gets it. He's really relaxed. You never see, I've never saw him stressed out. You know, I'm sure he was at some points. I don't know. Sure. I never saw it. Yeah, sure. That's important when on a Star Wars set because you hear horror stories of a director <laughs> just yelling. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I've been, and I've been lucky enough, you know, of all the films I've worked on, I've never seen it. It's just sort of if you work with the right directors that surround themselves with the right team. Sure, sure. And uh, there are things we can't talk about. Hint, hint. <laughs> wink, wink. But, uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> but but I know I know what we can talk about. Rogue, Rogue One. Rogue One. Now, pal. Like I said before, I'm a big fan of aliens. Mm -hmm. I just think they're the coolest thing in the world. And Force Friday, you know, when they released yeah. all the new toys before the movie, they they had a preview, and it was like, all right, we got this alien pack, and there's this alien. His name's Commander Pal. And I was like, what is this? Yeah. We've got an alien soldier on the ground, and you're the only alien on the ground, on Scarif, like, yeah. handling some business. Yeah, it was pretty what, bonkers. What was that like? Well, we'll start at the beginning. So you're in London. You're handling all, mm -hmm. all the Neil Scanlon stuff. They fly you to the Maldives, I'm assuming. No, I there. didn't go to I didn't go to the Maldives. You didn't go to the Maldives? No. no. This no. Is, I'm glad we started at the beginning then. Yeah. Really? All your stuff was there. Yeah, the Maldives was wow. the near the end of the shoot. Um That makes sense? Yeah. So the <laughs> for, yeah. Um <laughs> so originally I was supposed to do POW. I was supposed to do um, one of the calamari. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to do another character. But then uh, there was a rewrite, and Pal's character got moved up. 
um, so like we're just gonna just let you just focus on on pow and I was like cool yeah. and um, we that was about four months before we started shooting I was going in for fittings and we went through a lot of different fittings because originally they thought, oh, we can get Pow's, we can get Pow's tongue to move with your tongue. And I was like, how are we going to do that? And they're like, funny that would look. <laughs> his giant head and just yeah. a little thing. They're thing. like, we're going we're gonna to prosthetically put his tongue on your tongue. And I was like, mm, okay, <laughs> we can give that a go. Uh, and we tried it. And like, the, I was like, that's not going to work. I'm choking. I'm choking. This thing is... I'm like no, um, so we had to like they had to rearrange all of that. But it was it came off of um I think Pow originally again Jake Lunt Davies designed Pow and I think originally he put him up for Force Awakens in sort of this sort of uh, oh. uh you know he had this like shredded shirt with some bones around his neck or something like that, and he redesigned them and put him in some army stuff. Um, and they accepted yeah. it, and uh, and I remember my, one of my first fittings. They called me up, and there I was in the fitting, and they were like, um, uh, "Before you go home, you need to meet uh, you, you need to meet with Gareth because he's here, and he, he wanted to to speak with you." And I was like, "Gareth Ed- Edwards?" <laughs> they're like, <laughs> "Yeah." They're like, "Yeah." And I was like, "Wait, am I gonna?" It's like going to the principal's office. I'm like, yeah, exactly. The director <laughs> never asked for us. What, what's going on? Sure. And I went, yeah, and I chatted to, went in and had about a half hour conversation with Gareth. Um, wow. And it was really cool. And he was just really, he, he comes across like he, he is how he comes across. He's really just sort of soft spoken. Sweet dude. Yeah. And a fan. He, yeah, exactly. And he was like, these are the ideas that I have for how and the creatures and this is what i was thinking how they can interact in this environment you know and and what do you think and i was like yeah i totally i agree i've I've seen him like maybe i've seen the design maybe once or twice and he's like yeah i just i really fell in love with this idea that he's just sort of this jaw just sort of this mouth opens really big and it yells and he goes and we can play around with that and do a couple variations i was like yeah totally so we had this half hour conversation and, and he is so down to earth and i remember at the end i said you know thank you so much because uh, this this conversation we don't really get that um sure. yeah and he was like well you know he's, we're all in this together and i was like yeah you know I, I really appreciate it. this is like my my third movie you know and he's like this is my third movie <laughs> and i was like <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Dude, yeah that's that so makes cool sense. yeah so he was really lovely and um we just sort of developed the character from there um we took that and then we we just sort of they just we went with it Dude, so you legit like had even more than usual input into this character. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at that cool. point the design was made, but yeah, it was um, yeah, it was a it was a really cool thing to take away and, and work with Paul Paul Casey with with the movement, yeah. he, and he was he was doing the movement on it as well. Uh, and I got to work really close with um, a puppeteer called Phil Woodfine, uh, cool. and he Phil Woodfine again. He's done. He's done everything. He's mm-hmm. uh, he's worked with Neil for 25, 30 years. And um, he was the external puppeteer for Pal, and he was the guy that was in my ear for a lot of the time. And so we were there on set every day, uh, and we were just com- constantly hashing out different ideas and different things we could do. And it was essentially because with Pal, um, I was completely blind. I couldn't see a thing, and I couldn't hear. see out of? I, I couldn't. Um, oh, at all? You're just <laughs> at all. So they would maybe, if they opened up the mouth fully, mm-hmm. I could see like half an inch below. Oh, so you know. like see your your view was like in his mouth when you opened it up. Sort of, yeah. Just above, just a slightly above his his top lip. Wow. So they painted. So the all uh, the whole bottom of my face was painted black, and then they put a prosthetic across my uh mouth and nose that look like the inside of a, a throat um what? so that's that so cool yeah so that when the mouth was fully extended i could see about a half an inch on the ground uh, sure. but they couldn't open the mouth that much because then would just burn out the batteries because it was right. a lot of energy so sure. it, was, it was um it was phil just sort of guiding me around all the time going left left right right and i had so in one year i had the audio for the actors so i could hear cues and in my other ear i had phil giving me his audio and direction 
Um, and then I just had to go to a quiet place because it was just <laughs> like you have 30 motors going on inside your head and it's a shell. It becomes a cave of just like, an, you know, on the outside, it's like a humming sound. And on the inside, it's like just somebody yelling. <laughs> yeah, but just like yeah. loud. And, um, <laughs> so, you know, you put one of those heads on and you just sort of you got to close your eyes. Uh, because you you have all of these mechs in front of your face, so your eyes can't focus because of the depth. Sure. So you close your eyes, and uh, you just, you know, between takes, it's not like you can take the head off and have a coffee. Uh, sure. Because it takes sure. 15 minutes just to put the head on. So uh, and you just have to be one of those people that aren't claustrophobic and uh, is really cool about just chilling out. Um, and I think, I think the longest we did it for, the longest I was in the head, it was uh, six and a half hours. Oh my god! Straight. Yeah, I was like, "That's a ma- you should get a shirt made." <laughs> uh, yeah, I need think I needed some therapy after that. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it was, a, how, it was a crazy one. How are the mechanics from the inside different between the Tarsuds and Pow? Because the well, costume's different. Yeah, the costume's very different. The Tarsuds, mm. uh, the mechs was all on the head. So I could yeah, hear yeah. a bit more because the mechs were all on, on uh, above me. Uh, with, sets. Yeah, with Pow, his mechs were all around my face, um, so I could they hear the mouth. Yeah, I could hear and feel everything. Um, wow. And the costume was, the costume was okay. It was the backpack that was just really uncomfortable. Um, sure. The backpack, it was like it was a weird one. It pushed my it pushed my shoulders right back, but I had to push my shoulders forward in order to hold the gun, so my arms would go numb after like ten minutes. <laughs> so I'd be like, I couldn't feel my arms, and we'd be <laughs> we'd be running through these explosions. I'd be like, I can't feel my arms. <laughs> like, you should... yeah. And they're like, you need to be worrying about not dying. And I'd be like, oh, I'm worried about the blood going to my hands. <laughs> yeah. You're like I'm gonna drop this gun and look really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Did you in the in the scene where Pow does his yell? Did mm. you yell something? Gotta ask. Were you in it? Or were they just like, we're gonna open it? All right, here we go. Take a breath. Oh yeah, I mean, I was yelling, but so was Phil. Uh, okay, beautiful. Uh, so they're taking the audio off of Phil, and I'm just doing it because. I mean, you have to. You have wow. to. I mean, it, uh, we uh, otherwise, if you don't. If you don't do it, then if I'm inside, like, just chilling out, maybe half asleep, physically yeah. it won't look right. <laughs> yeah, you'll start seeing Pal hunched over, like, Boba yeah. like, wait yeah. a minute. <laughs> yeah. So if you're yelling, then physically, uh, you know, without even thinking, your your whole body is going to react the same way. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, there were so many, uh, you know, it, it was like living in a, a 10-year-old dream because you got yeah. essentially in a war movie. I, dude, I, when I saw, and I sent it to you, that uh, behind-the-scenes thing they did oh, on you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I hadn't seen uh, that. Dude, it's so good. Yeah. It's like a, I think it was with a Target exclusive or something like that. But, yeah, um, I had never seen that before you sent it to me. It was really cool. It was amazing because I remember there was one shot of you. It had to have been a test footage or something because you were like in front of a screen, and you're like in it, and you're doing the yell bit. Oh, it yeah. so cool and real and you sell it and yeah that was the test that was the screen testing yeah when they they brought each creature in and we screen tested it all of that uh and that was the day we found out that i needed uh, a filtration uh an air system because oh, yeah. um, <laughs> the skin was about two inches thick and all it right. was um it wasn't foam it wasn't foam oh, really? skin. yeah to make it look the way it needed to look uh, yeah. And because of that, with the mouth closed, it meant that after about a minute, I couldn't breathe. I had no air coming in. So I was like, get, I was going to faint. Uh, yeah. So they purposely built this whole rig on my waist where it was a fan built into one of the packs on my waist that would suck air and pump it through my chest and into a hose that would just pump air into the head so I could ah, breathe. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Was, the gu- was the gun heavy? No, the gun was all right. The gun was really yeah. light. Yeah. It's all the backpack. It was, yeah, it was the backpack. I was like, oh god! I had a uh, I had a nine numb mask made. Mm. Uh, there's actually a guy in Ireland, uh, Chris Stevens, great dude. Um, mm. And I I'm in the Rebel Legion in the 501st. Yeah. And I have a I have a Jedi character who's a Solaston. And in oh, Florida, nice. in Florida with a latex mask of nine numb. And I know so what good. you mean by no filtration because yeah. you're just breathing your breath back in. Yeah, you're just like, like, it's hot. It's really bad. I, put, yeah. I thought I'm I'd pass be smart. Out. Yeah, I was like, I got this because I've got a clone trooper and a storm trooper as well that I built. And I have fans in the helmets. Mm. And I was like, all right, it'll work the same way. 
Uh, no, not at all. Because <laughs> all it's doing is circulating in a circle the air you're breathing. There's no out. <laughs> so yeah. it's pretty smart to have from the outside in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys, you guys really know what you're doing over there. The bad part is one day we were filming uh, and we we're just between takes and I was uh, Morna, who was the, Morna McPherson, who was the fabricator on Powell. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a legend. I mean, oh man, she, she, she had to put up with me for five months. <laughs> Um, she's we a were, legend yeah. besides her work yeah and we were we were um standing there and i was like i'm feeling really lightheaded <clears throat> morna and she was like are you okay and i was like just just like i'm just smelling this really bad smell and what it was is um it was just after one of the battles so they had all of this fire and uh-huh. uh, smoke going up and there was one of oh, the no. dudes with it's just a fire and a fan just and he just happened to be standing beside me, and my fan was sucking in all of the fumes and just pumping it. <laughs> into the, and Morna's like, "Oh my goodness, move, move, move!" And I was like, "What?" And she's like, "We've been standing beside the petrol guy." <laughs> I was that, like, oh, that is amazing. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. How long was the shoot uh, with Pal on Scarif? So we shot in a place uh, just north of of Pinewood called Bovington. It's an old airfield strip. And they, right they, they built the Maldives there. It was crazy. They built what? the whole, they brought palm trees, so much sand. They even built like a lake. Um, what? Oh yeah. Like this massive lake. Um, so it was a massive, it was massive. So I think we were there for about five weeks. Dude. And then at the end of the shoot, they went to the Maldives to shoot some, some wide shots and some other uh, close up oh, shots. Of okay. That. Yeah. That is amazing because I totally thought you went to the Maldives. Uh, yeah. I mean, I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think from a production cost point of view, when, when you have a creature character, because um, mm-hmm. I it, every this is the thing that people don't realize is every creature you see in the background of Star Wars, like if you see any creatures just in the background, they'll each have about three or four people with them. Sure. So somebody sure. for like POW, you know, I had about five people with me. So if I go somewhere, five other people have to come with me. Right. So it's a it's right. a six it's a six man job for one character and you're just like going, Wow, that's a lot of money. <laughs> um, sure, yeah. 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 Absolutely. And then I gotta get the costume and the props there. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. And if anything goes wrong and there's only one head, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. That's why movies cost so much. People don't realize. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had to. They had to build a stunt foam head specifically for that because I couldn't run through any water uh, with an animatronic oh. head on. Right. Did you Did you fall at any point? Uh, uh, I I took a <laughs> knee once. <laughs> took a knee. Took a knee. That's, I was coming out of I was coming out of a trench. Um, oh, right on. So it was like a four foot incline up a trench, blind. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, of course, of course. Yeah, I'll take an E. Zero limability. There's, there's crates everywhere. You know, I wouldn't hold it against you if you ran into a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> you did have a great moment setting the charge, though. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I get. I, it was a really, um, that was a cool one. That was about, uh, I must have taken like 10 or 15 takes. Um, <laughs> you, just, you just hit it and it falls over. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah, because it was only one spot where I could hit that uh, pillar on. Oh, really? Because it was magnetic. <laughs> it was a magnetic strip on, on my detonator on. I had to hit the metal part of that set. Sure. And, um, and <laughs> You can't it, see. Yeah, and the whole take was I had to come out from the forest, <laughs> creep around a crate, and come up and, and set the charge. And I was like, uh Okay, and we have to do it by steps. So I was having to count my steps going, okay, after four steps, I, I'm navigating to my left, and then that's three steps until I have to do two steps to my left in order to find the set, the, sure. the piece that I have to put the detonator on. Um, and then I have to hit the detonator in the right spot. So we did that about 10 or 15 takes. And then uh, the next the next guy they did was a human rebel, and uh, they were like, yeah, just just sort of put it on the wall. Just we're just gonna have the human standing there and just just reach to your right. It doesn't matter. You can hit any part of the wall. And just, I was like, why couldn't I do that? <laughs> he can see. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> why did I have to do? But then all you see in the movie is literally me just just putting my hand out and sticking it on. I was like, oh great. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, People don't know that I walked through woods first. <laughs> yeah. I want that noted. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. It's this is why I had you on, Derek. Yeah. <laughs> the, the real truth. <laughs> yeah. The plights of pow. Yeah. That's amazing. 
I mean, it's a it's a big deal. Pal is is a very big deal because, like I said, you've got this very small band of rebels, and even like within the story, very small band of rebels that are like, we're literally going on a suicide mission. Yeah. And there's one alien, there's one dude that's like, yeah, we got it. And you're it that was, dude. It was a really yeah, it was a really fun time. It was a really cra- and the action figure is just sort of the icing on the oh. cake and um immortalized in plastic and and that because because they do uh computer generated scanning so uh, that is quite literally me scaled down to 3.75 inches so that's all my dimensions that's me proportionally um so cool yeah and and the lovely thing is when i opened up the visual dictionary i had no idea because i've i've gotten to know pablo hidalgo um when he was visiting on set fan of him yeah, and because he's a Canadian, he well, he grew up in Canada. Yeah, yeah, he's a, uh, Can- a Chilean Canadian. Yeah, so <laughs> yep. we we got it chatting a bit about that. And we've sort of you know every time I see him on set, we have a chat about life and just stuff. And sure. um, I opened up the visual dictionary and uh, saw Pow's full name um, because his name's Paddock Trabit, but his full name is is something like fifty two letters long. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in the middle of it, he, he fit my name into it. So, That's so I think cool. his name's like Paddock Drabbit Tackett, Sep. And then he's put Derek. Uh, he fit my, my name into this. this yeah. I was like, that was, so I sent him a, a message just sort of saying thank you. And there's just sort of a lovely sort of thing else to have. So you have this action figure, you have this character named after you. Yeah. Now you're like forever cemented into Star Wars history, which is. The yeah, I was like, thing in the world. I, can die. I'm happy. I'm good. Yeah, and as a fan, I mean, that's one thing that I love as well about Star Wars. I mean, yourself included, is the people working on it actually care. Yeah, you know, like they're fans as well. And in Hollywood, you don't get that very often. No, and and I think that's the thing. Like, I I always thought I was like, yeah, I'm a fan. I've seen Star Wars. I I love the prequels because I grew up with the prequels. Me when, too. Yeah. Oh, I mean, we just became best friends. Yeah, when I was, I mean, I was. Uh, when did Phantom Menace come out? Phantom Menace 99. came out. 99. So I was about 15. Right on. And I remember, I yeah, I remember lining up for it in the cinema because I was like, guys, we need to go to the movie theater. There's a new Star Wars <laughs> movie coming out because I'd seen the old ones and I liked them and I loved them. Mm-hmm, and I'd okay. seen the prequels and I loved the prequels because, you know, I was that age. Yeah, uh, um, the backstory to the thing you already love. Yeah. And I, I mean, I always I find it weird because a lot of people hate them. Um, yeah, and I just think, well, no, because when when Lucas made those, when Lucas made A New Hope in '77, mm-hmm. he was trying something new that no one had yep. done before, and he took mm-hmm. a chance. And I think with the prequels, he was trying something new, agreed, that nobody was doing before. So you can't fault that, and it's the same ethos and mentality that they're continuing with in Rogue One. They yep. they've really pushed the facial recognition with Tarkin and Leia. Oh my God! That Some people have tried it, but they're now taking it to the blowing. next level. And you have to you you got to appreciate that kind of stuff. And so I've never had an issue with the prequels. I've always quite respected them. Um, and so I always thought, yeah, I'm a fan. And I got to set, and I got talking to people <laughs> like Brian Herring. Brian yep. Brian is a fan. Um, yeah, oh yeah. And I realized quite fast that I knew nothing about Star Wars. <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a fan, but these guys these guys know their stuff. Right, right. Yeah, Th- yeah. That was one thing that I really loved about Gareth Edwards. Mm. Is he's like, the, his history with it, and he's like, no, I'm a massive, massive Star Wars fan. And yeah. 4 is his favorite. And he made the movie that's in literally right into 4. It's yeah. like... And for his thirtieth birthday, he went to yes. uh, he went to Tatooine. Yeah, and he drank the, the blue milk. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's beautiful. See, stuff like that just makes me so happy. Yeah. Oh, so good, so good. And um, you're just you're on it, man. You're on the <laughs> precipice of this all happening. You're in it. Yeah, it's sort of again this sort of Neil. It's it's all down to Neil Scanlon and and his crew because they are really loyal. Um, sure. and it is a family there. So when you work with them and you're in with them, then they sort of stay really loyal to you. Um, sure. and it is easy because, because once you know what you're doing and once they know what they're doing, it's just sort of easy to fall into that. So it's been a, it's been a crazy ride. It's been about four heat, four years, which is, you know, which is crazy. I never thought I would be here, you know, having sure. come to London, just sort of never working on a film before having, now just jumping from the film yeah and let's see how many star wars characters have you played then including lugabeast lugabeast the chancellor of oberdan pow uh i puppeteered i was 
part of like one of 15 people that did uh, Borg Gullet. Oh, what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. we're diving down this road. Yeah. What is, Borg okay, Gullet. how much is Borg Gullet uh, practical? Like those tentacles? CGI. Uh, Explain all, to me. So Borg Gullet was the yeah, it was he was um uh that whole set was raised about seven or eight foot mm-hmm. and we were all uh under the stage. So he's half in the stage, so he's half uh you see Borg Gullet and there's half of him below the set. And uh-huh. so inside the head you had Tom. Tom Wilton was inside oh, the, the head moving the, the temples and the, the pulsing of the, the brain. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Phil Woodfine, who did the puppetry um, for the external puppetry for POW, he was doing, I think, the eyes right, or the face. Know. Yeah. Um, uh, so there were three people up inside the head. There was Tom, Phil, and uh, a lovely puppeteer named uh, Lynn Robertson Bruce. And then I was on the, the stomach and the belly and uh, oh, uh, the breath and all of that. And then there was about 10 other puppeteers on the tentacles. Um, oh. And some of them were crew. A lot of them were crew. And then there were about two or three guys, Brian and Dave, who did BB-8, were yeah. on the outside doing all of the external stuff. Um, so, yeah, we did, we did, it was about a two. That was the first thing we shot on Rogue One. Really? So I think we did about a week or two on that, and then we went right to Bovington to do five weeks of, of POW. Wow. Uh, that's pretty crazy yeah so and then well and then bovington was about five or six weeks and then we jumped to to yavin and all of that other stuff but um yeah right. so borg gullet yeah it was about i want to say 15 but it's around that number of different people and puppeteers manipulating that good lord yeah really cool yeah really cool it character. was crazy and the whole back end of borg gullet was like something like half that, a ton of water yeah that like yellow pod looking whatever that is it was full of water and i remember under oh, yeah. set yeah under set there was a plastic stopper there was like a, a weight and they're like <laughs> if you hit that all of the water will come out and i was like uh okay <laughs> like, so hit it yeah Don't and they were hit just it. covering it in slime and have and the slime was coming under set it was it was crazy it was messy that's amazing yeah do you have i mean they've got to be all like your children do you have a favorite character that you've played uh yeah so i mean lug of beast holds a special part just because it was the first thing i ever sure filmed sure. on like it was the first thing i ever did mm-hmm. and it was such a long journey to get to where we <laughs> did it it was like in it. Yeah. yeah uh so yeah i mean lug of beast sort of holds a, a special part fober dan uh i think i'll do it's a really hard one pal is lovely yeah, you're like all of them. Okay. All of them. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's a good answer. It's a good answer. Do yeah. You have a, do you have a favorite Star Wars character? I love Phasma. Really? Yeah, it's the only Phasma. toy I bought from Force Awakens was uh, oh, the Black man. Series Phasma. I love just the design of Phasma. Uh, that is cool. Love Gwendolyn Christie. I think she's amazing. But I'm oh, a ma- I'm a massive be. Game of Thrones fan as well. So same same <laughs> uh, and she's really cool like i've never had a conversation with her but i've seen her on set so you sure know, from afar she's really sure. cool from 10 feet away uh, yeah <laughs> she's really tall so you can yeah. see her very well and i just Dude. love that character i love the idea that um there's this this female stormtrooper that leads them i love it i think yeah. it's a great yeah i really love phasma and the chrome and then the whole bit that it's like yeah yacht, exactly the all... backstory with that too yeah phasma's like one of my best, but before before these ones came out, um, I don't really know. Sort of was. Hmm, I can't stand Qui Gon Jinn. I think he was the worst. <gasps> Just messing with you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I was like, wait a minute. We've been friends for a while now. <laughs> He's the worst. You. He's just God. If only he knew what was up. Yeah. <laughs> well played, sir. Well yeah. played. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> you caught me off guard. You <laughs> You're like, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wait. You know what you did. <laughs> that's fair. So you're pretty excited for episode eight. You can't talk about some behind the scenes stuff, but I can't I mean, talk tra- about it. But in the trailer, we saw Phasma fighting Finn. That's kind of cool, I guess. Did yeah. I'm looking forward to yeah. that. Seeing what happens there. Uh, 
We spotted Volberdan. Volberdan's we poking did around. Yeah. Behind Amelin Holdo. Yeah. I'm, Laura Dern. <laughs> I remember I immediately tweeted out. He was like, hey, man, what's up? You, yeah. Uh, yeah. What's going we, on? Uh, yeah. How are you, man? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I don't know. I mean, it looks like Volberdan. Can, <laughs> cannot confirm nor deny. Yeah. <laughs> Laura Dern, and I'm a massive yeah. Jurassic Park fan. Oh, I mean, see, that's another thing Jurassic that I love Park. about your story, because you're the Jurassic Park guy. Man. I and love like, now, Jurassic now you're Park. you're doing puppeteering, and you're doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I love Jurassic Park, and, uh, you know, Fulber Dan, he, he got to see Laura Dern, and... He did, he did. It was a hard day. Yeah, <laughs> it was a hard day. <laughs> it's but a good it... thing they can't hear you in the mask, because you're just, like, <laughs> screaming. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if that is you, I mean, we if that know. is, we don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, but I am. To... I'm looking forward to uh, the Last Jedi. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As a as a fan, yeah, yeah. it's pretty good. Which is good. Ryan, yeah. Ryan Johnson seems like one of the most delightful people ever. Yeah, I mean, if I were to have uh, been a, you've seen. if I were to have been a part of Episode Eight, and yeah. Hypothetically speaking. Hypothetically speaking, if I were a part of episode eight and I were to do some really cool creatures on episode eight and go to some really cool locations and see some of the storylines and some of the story arcs that some of the characters take. Sure. I mean, I'd be really excited. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be kind of cool it would that be. you were there like yeah. at the beginning of Ray's journey with the Lugabees to like maybe kind yeah. of see where she goes. I mean, I if mean, I was a part of that, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I mean... If, but, but if I was a part of that, it would be amazing. Yeah, you know, I mean, I can only imagine, as I'm sure you can only imagine. Yeah, yeah. But I've always, I've always said that, you know, you see people who, who are like, oh, we want to know, we want to know what happens. I was like, you don't want to know, man. Because no. if this was the 80s and we had social media the way we have now and everybody came out and said, hey, guess what? Vader's Luke's father... I mean, oh, yeah. you see videos on YouTube with people who are just shooting their children watching that moment. You you know, you see mm -hmm. like YouTube videos oh, of beautiful. like, these are the moments. And you're like, that, because everybody can remember that moment. If you're a Star Wars fan, you can remember oh, yeah. that moment, not see it coming. And I think mm -hmm. that that's the lovely part of it. So this idea that people want spoilers and they want to know what happens is like, you don't. Because when you watch it, you want you're not going to enjoy it. Yeah. yeah, you're not going to take because you didn't know what was going to happen in the 70s and the 80s, and that's why you love it so much is because you were part of the story investing in it. Absolutely. And if you want the spoilers and want to know everything, it's like you're not going to invest in it because you're just going to be waiting for those moments that you, you think you know. Absolutely. I'm, I'm with you. I have, I have full faith in Disney's uh, plan of rollout because I watch uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., great show, mm -hmm. and I will never forget how they handled uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. being Hydra. Because yeah, they had yeah, yeah. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which is a show about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and then Captain America Winter Soldier came out, and yeah. then you find out that, like, oh, S.H.I.E.L.D. is like a majority Hydra now. That following Tuesday, the episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you find out, like, two of the characters were Hydra the whole time. And oh, I was crazy. Like, <gasps> I've never seen S.H.I.E.L.D. Dude, it's I highly recommend it. It's really good. Mm -hmm. um, but just that rollout, I was like, wow, so Disney obviously planned this forever ahead, you know? And they're like, yeah. we're going to have this show about S.H.I.E.L.D., have an episode, have that Friday Winter Soldier come out, and then on Tuesday, the show takes a complete 180. And I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. all right, I have full confidence now that, like, that's well why I played. watch. That's right. I watch trailers. I don't watch leaks. I don't like any of that stuff because yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. Whatever Disney gives me, I will consume it thoroughly. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 of course. But I'm of with course. you. I'm with you. You got to be in the theater with that moment, and it's it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, unrelated to Star Wars, have you ever been to Skellig Michael? I haven't. No, it's beautiful. I've been. Yeah. yeah. Oh, have you? Oh. I went, I went uh, to. I I actually I went to Ireland for like a week and a half last year, and then I was in London for five days. And oh, nice. If I had known we were friends then, <laughs> uh, you know, hindsight, whatever. Hindsight. <laughs> I was I was there for Brexit, which was really fun. <laughs> uh, uh, the worst. The five the days. Worst. I, the five days I was there was. I didn't know what was going on. It was two days before the vote, the day of the vote, and two days uh, after. The worst. So I, I got a I got a wonderful experience. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> oh but, man, but country was heartbroken. It was crazy, but dude. Well, London was. Yeah. Yes, you you have to go to Skellig Michael. It's like a pilgrimage, especially now. Mm. But yeah, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's 
it's like a whole other world. Like when I went yeah, up there, yeah, yeah, it's like three hundred plus steps. And as you get higher, the steps get high. The steps get taller. So you're like, uh, oh. you're just, and so you have to earn it. <laughs> yeah, and then that's when, worth it. When you get up there, you're like nine miles off the coast, so you're surrounded by ocean. And when I was up there, the weather got less great as we got there, so it was just fog everywhere. Ah, uh, yeah, so, well, yeah, Ireland. So imagine being on that rock, and then fog rolls in, so you can't see anything. Yeah. You're just on this like other planet. It's crazy. Crazy. Yeah, you I mean, I've go. been to Ireland. I just haven't been to uh, Skelly. You have to. You have to. Highly yeah. recommend it. But this has been super fun. Dude, yeah, I hope, man. Hope you've had a good time. It's been uh, yeah, like a year in the making. <laughs> yeah, it has. Yeah, it's just you're hard bu- to so, like you're a busy man. get some time off. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's busy like making Star Wars or not. <laughs> yeah, or not. You know, it's just like you know, your your life changes in a phone call, and then you're just sort of there for you know that's right seven months six months and it's just like oh man so when you have a day off it's a day off and yeah. if you don't have a day you know you work six days a week yeah i hear you for so, yeah. ridiculous hours but yeah uh, yeah i hope you've had a good time this is this yeah i did this is my this is my first podcast is it really yeah, i've never Dude. done a podcast before oh man well i'm yeah. gonna tell everyone that <laughs> <laughs> well there you go yeah I did a, an interview for uh, a Star Wars Insider, right on. Uh, and then I think another website. But yeah, this is my first podcast, man. But yeah, totally awesome. Good, good, good. I appreciate the time. Uh, yeah, of course, man. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Where can people find you online? Uh, I'm on Twitter. You are on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I do Twitter. That's about it. Uh, I'm on Facebook, but I'm not on Facebook as me. Uh, yeah. I'm a very different person. Yeah, uh, Facebook is Voberdand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Facebook's for family. That's right. Uh, Smart. Yeah. So Smart. Twitter. Yeah. It's just, just. What's my Twitter name? What's my Twitter name? Your Twitter actor, name is uh, actor D Arnold. That's it. I mean, yeah. Not that, not that I know it. I mean, it just sort of yeah. like came to me. Right. <laughs> actor D Arnold. Yeah. That's right. Highly recommend. Pal of Overdan. Yeah. Bunch of other cool stuff. Maybe Han Solo. Maybe Episode Eight. I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, we'll have to see. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but until next time. And awesome.